I never know how long these uh, podcasts are going to be, but I have a feeling this will be quite long. So if you have no interest in Spinoza, then <coughs> the best thing you can do is flip out of it now. Anyway, there's uh, a very good video uh, made by Sam Vaknin. I don't know if you've come across Sam Vaknin. He's a professor of psychology at, um, I think it's an Israeli university. In this video, he says that uh, essentially contemporary psychology is lost. It isn't science. Uh, if you look at sciences, they have fundamental ideas. So in physics, for example, Newton's three laws are fundamental laws that you can derive almost everything from. You don't really need to ad lib. Psychology doesn't have that. Uh, so he gives the um, example of some kind of directory of uh, pathologies. And he says that, well, 10, 20 years ago, it maybe had a hundred entries in it. Today it has a thousand. Uh, why does it have a thousand? Well, because there's no root ideas in psychology. Everybody's keen to identify some kind of pathology and put their name to it. So, you know, uh, John Smith might discover a twitching left eye pathology and call it the John Smith twitching left eye um, syndrome. I like the word syndrome. Well, Spinoza's psychology is wholly different to that. He starts from just one basic concept, which I'll get to very shortly. But his treatment of our uh, psychological makeup is echoed very strongly by Nietzsche. In fact, Nietzsche stated that he considered Spinoza to be his only predecessor. Having said that, Nietzsche was quite cruel about Spinoza in places, but nonetheless, he did say that he thought Spinoza was his only worthy pro, uh, predecessor. Uh, many of these philosophers, uh, Schopenhauer included, have talked about will and power. Not so much Schopenhauer, but uh, the idea of power is central to all of this. And actually, recently, evolutionary psychology is kind of uh, reinforcing a lot of the things that Spinoza talked about. So, let's talk about this central idea. The central idea is, well, it, there's an ancient term for it, the conatus, C-O-N-A-T-U-S. It's an ancient idea uh, even Cicero used it millennia before uh, Spinoza. It depicts the striving that we all undertake to ensure our survival. So in essence, it's the survival drive. And for Spinoza, the canatus, this survival drive, is the central feature in our psychology. Darwin uh, posited, as you probably know, that the survival and procreation drives are uh, primary. Spinoza doesn't really talk about the procreation drive at all. And in that sense, it is a bit of an omission. Uh, as you may know, Darwin wondered why the hell uh, peacocks would display, while well, the male peacocks would display these huge array of feathers and the, these feathers clearly impeded its movement, so it couldn't escape from predators all that well. And then he, he kind of um, realized that this was obviously an attraction to the females. And the male almost put uh, its procreation potential above its own survival. Anyway, as far as Spinoza is concerned... Uh, our striving to exist is our core thing. And in fact, even procreation is, 
in a sense, a way to ensure our survival in the future through transmitting our genes. So you could say that the, um, the survival drive is the core thing within us. Now, uh, Spinoza goes further by saying that this canatus, this drive, is actually the root power of God. Now, you need to understand that for Spinoza, God and nature are equivalent. Uh, there's no big man in the sky who is sat up there separated from uh, the world as such. God is in nature. There, there are some nuances, but um, that's not the uh, main message in this podcast. But this power of manifestation, this power that makes us want to survive is a trait of God or a, an essential trait in nature. So in uh, part four of his ethics, he states the power whereby each single thing and consequently man preserves its own being is the very power of God or nature. So the power whereby each single thing and consequently man preserves his own being that power, our ability to maintain our existence, is kind of inherited from God or nature. Uh, what Spinoza doesn't talk about so much is the existential issue this raises. So we all strive with all our might to exist, but we all know that we're going to die. This causes suffering, obviously, and in the Zen tradition, uh, it's stated that the root of all our suffering is the desire to exist, which indeed it is. Spinoza does treat this issue uh, quite directly. He shows that when our power for existence is in some way being diminished, we suffer, uh, creating the emotions, negative and painful emotions. I want to talk about this whole idea of God or nature being this push to manifest and to continue in existence. It's the case of uh, quite a few religions, spiritual traditions, uh, even psychoanalysts, I'll name a few in a moment, and philosophers have stated that the world is a kind of um, excess manifested by an underlying void. The void isn't nothing. The void is kind of like a pregnant, um, a pregnant potential. So uh, Nietzsche talked about the will to power. He never att attributed that to God as such, but he said that basically the whole world is a will to power. So more recently, psychoanalysts, uh, well, more recently, within the last hundred or so years, uh, psychoanalysts such as Freud, Lacan, Will Willicott have seen the world as emerging from this pregnant void. And there's a whole other podcast here, but this pregnant void isn't, um, what's the word, isn't benign. But as I say, another podcast. So, to put Spinoza's view of the whole thing into context, which I'm trying to do, this whole idea of a pregnant void, in Spinoza's terminology, substance, so Spinoza talks about substance, it's uh, an unmanifest power, if you like. Substance is the void. It's not nothing. It's almost like a a yearning to express and manifest. So substance is the void, and this gives rise to, in Spinoza's word, things. And the things are this act of expression. Uh, if you want an example of this from science, then uh, there's something called quantum froth, which is just a spontaneous, short-lived emergence of atomic particles, seemingly from nothing. 
You know, one cubic centimeter has billions of these things at any moment in time appearing and disappearing within nanoseconds. It's like uh, the void cannot help but manifest. So, um, having talked about the canatus, which is this striving to exist, and the nature of God as a kind of pregnant void, we can start to talk about the essence of man. Now, for Spinoza, the canatus, this striving, is our very essence. Essence has a particular word, uh, sorry, a particular meaning for Spinoza. Uh, the word essence means or describes a property that determines all the other properties of a thing. So you can see that this is a, a kind of inferential thing for Spinoza. We determine what the, the essence is, the essence being the canatus. And then we can determine a whole pile of other things just by thinking about it, basically. I'll get on to that later when I talk about the emotions. Um, so if the canatus is the very root of us, its effect is going to be felt everywhere. And particularly in our desires, our emotions, our thoughts and our actions, the canatus will determine all those things. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. You spend your day time mainly, anyway, ensuring your survival, getting money from work, uh, finding a, a, a mate, establishing shelter, getting medical care, you know, all those things which occupy a very large part of our uh, day. Those are, well, they represent our striving to continue in our existence. So, um, in part three of the ethics, Spinoza says the canatus with which each thing endeavours to persist in its own being is nothing but the actual essence of the thing itself. It's worth pointing out here that academics tend to, ig <laughs> it's amusing really, they tend to ignore part three and four of the ethics, which is where Spinoza is talking about all of this. Uh, they like the ontology in part one, they like the epistemology in part two, and they kind of ignore the rest of it. However, things are changing. There is more and more interest in Spinoza's ideas around our psychological makeup, and as such, part three and four of the ethics, which is his masterwork, um, are getting more attention. Now, another thing that's uh, worth mentioning <coughs> is that as far as Spinoza is concerned, and he was a, um, a determinist really, it was probably not quite right, but he, he, he believed that we are totally driven by cause and effect. So as far as Spinoza is concerned, our inner world is determined in exactly the same way as the outer world. In the outer world, uh, cause and effect is the foundation stone of all our sciences. If you kick a ball, it goes into the air. If you let go of a stone, it drops down to the ground, you know, so on and so forth. So if causality is the bedrock of our understanding of the external world, then why isn't it the bedrock of the understanding of ourselves? Well, we like to f flatter ourselves that we have free will. But as far as Spinoza is concerned, we are all, to use his words, mental automata. We're just kind of like robots buzzing about all over the place, driven primarily by this canatus. So um, the notion that we have free will, which offends many people, and in fact a kludge has been found, uh, is called compatibilism which basically says, well, if we can do what we will or what we want to do, then we have free will. It's not the point. Uh, Kant called compatibilism just word juggling, and I agree. So Schopenhauer kind of nailed the whole thing very well. He said, we can do what we will, which is kind of compatibilism, 
but we cannot will what we will. It's worth thinking about that for a moment. You cannot will what you will. So if you will to, I don't know, eat a donut or something, you cannot then will a different will. Or you might say to yourself, well, my will is to eat the donut, but actually I'm now going to um, will that I don't eat the donut. Well, all you're doing is it's like an, you know, a, a, an infinite regression. You, you're then saying, well, I've now got another will. Well, where did that will come from? Um, the arguments are pretty solid around all of this. And as Nietzsche said, everyone who's got more than a couple of brain, and these are not his words exactly, but everyone who's got more than a couple of brain cells firing qu can quite easily see that we don't have free will. Anyway, so this is an essential part of uh, Spinoza's analysis of the human condition that we don't have free will and we are mental automata. Now, there are various implications of this that are very, very unpopular, which is why um, probably people don't talk about them. But as the Buddhists would say, there's no praise or blame. If we're mental automata, if we just do what we do because that's what we do, that's how we're programmed effectively, then how can there be praise or blame? And we certainly shouldn't indulge in regret, guilt, remorse, or any of what Spinoza called the sad emotions. You'd be surprised how many people, for example, are crippled by shame. It's a very big thing in many of the emails that I get. People will talk about shame. Well, I shall treat shame a little bit later on, but um, there's no need for any of these things because if we understand that we act necessarily because we're mental automata, then where's the shame exactly? So, um, you know, those things do offend people, saying that there shouldn't be any regret or guilt or remorse. Uh, but let's offend people a little bit more by also stating that we're not responsible. How can a machine be held responsible? You know, Gorgiev talked about us being machines. The one escape from that that he gave us was to say that a machine that knows it's a machine is no longer just a machine. But I'm not going to go into all of that. So... Um, we're not responsible, we shouldn't indulge regret, guilt, remorse, shame. <laughs> this is why you can't talk about this stuff in a public forum particularly. And um, maybe you even shouldn't be putting podcasts out about it, but here we go, I am doing. So let's talk about the emotions. Uh, so just like we are mental automata, so according to Spinoza, we're kind of emotional automata as well. Our emotions rise naturally. You know, if someone insults you, you're going to feel probably angry. In fact, well, I won't go into that, but I had a, a bit of an altercation with a guy who was parking in an exit zone in a car park this morning. He wouldn't move. <laughs> he didn't like me beeping my horn. Anyway, there's a little story there, but I'll move on. So, the emotions are wholly natural. They're like a summer storm. You know, they come and go. But, of course, we've been taught in our society that anger, envy, uh, hatred, all those things that are quite natural are wrong. They're not wrong, you just need to understand them, which I shall get on to later as well. So, uh, we should not judge or censor our emotions in any way. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to express them, but within yourself, if you're angry, you're angry. Don't 
don't censor it. If you are jealous or envious, then you're jealous or envious. Don't censor it. Anyway, I should talk about that more later. So things like anger, envy, hatred, love, excitement, they're all natural. Uh, just like anything else, you know, a summer squall, they're, they're just natural things. What he does claim is that we can come to understand our emotions in the same way that we might understand anything else. And what are the emotions? Well, the emotions are just a barometer. If you are doing well in life, in other words, if your canatus is making its mark, you're striving to persist in your existence, if you're doing well in that respect, you'll have what are generally called positive emotions. Enthusiasm, excitement, love, all those things. If your canatus is thwarted, if you can't get what you want, if uh, maybe you're ill, something like that, then your canatus is diminished and you'll have so-called negative emotions. That's all there is to it in truth. Anyway, uh, I'll say more about that later. In his political treatise, um, Stephen Nadler wrote a book about Spinoza's political treatise. He, he, the title of the book was um, A Book Forged in Hell. <laughs> Spinoza was a bit of a lad. Uh, you may know that um, the Ethics, for example, was not published during his lifetime. People don't publish it. And even a hundred years after Spinoza's death, you were still seen as something of a, um, an aberration if you uh, studied Spinoza. Anyway, this is a quote from the political treatise, and it summarizes a whole nature of the way that we view the emotions. Philosophers, and you could say religious people, look upon the passions by which we are assailed as vices, into which men fall through their own fault. So it is their custom to deride, bewail, berate them, or if their purpose is to appear more zealous than others, to execrate them. They believe that they are thus performing a sacred duty that they are attaining the summit of wisdom when they have learnt how to shower extravagant praise on a human nature that nowhere exists and to revile that which actually exists or exists in actuality. The fact is they conceive men not as they are but as they would like them to be. You know, there's a whole riff on that but basically there is no shortage of people who will tell you how you should behave or what you should feel and they set this up as you know the religions and spiritual people are very good at this they set this up as some ideal and if you don't meet that ideal then in some way you're inadequate it's all nonsense of course our emotions the way we react to things are wholly natural but there are ways of dealing with them which i'll get to later so let's move on to pleasure and pain. So if the canatus is our driving force, is striving to exist, when the canatus is impeded, we feel pain because our, you know, our survival is being diminished a little bit. Our survival prospect, if you lose your job, you'll feel pain probably. Um, and when our canatus, our striving, is freely expressed, we feel pleasure. His exact statements on this are, pleasure is man's transition from a state of less perfection to a state of greater perfection. You should note that for Spinoza, perfection is the same as power. So you could read it as, pleasure is man's transition from a state of less power to a state of greater power power what? The power to exist. If your power to exist sees some kind of boost, you'll get pleasure from it. Equally, pain is man's transition from a state of greater perfection to a state of less perfection. So if your power in life is diminished, you'll feel pain. So we feel pleasure 
when, for example, uh, we suddenly find we've won a million dollars, say. But equally, if you um, fall with some kind of uh, serious illness, you're going to feel diminished and that's going to create negative uh, emotions or painful emotions. So remember, this is all driven by this one idea, the idea of the canatus. Um, this kind of thinking is sadly lacking in modern psychology. As Sam Vaknin says, it's really not a science, it's just this hodgepodge of, well, you know, he's got a twitching left eye, so it's a twitching left eye syndrome or whatever. So we're deriving the whole of human nature from just one concept, the concept that we strive to exist. So another way of looking at the uh, canatus is to see it as power, the power to survive. Uh, Spinoza is quite explicit about this in part four he sa of, of the ethics. He says, by virtue and power, I mean the same thing. There are all kinds of implications of that. This is going to be long enough, so I'm not going to particularly dive into that. But the power what? The power to exist. So for Spinoza, virtue isn't the same as the virtue of the Stoics, for example. Virtue is your ability to persist in your existence. And since this is the nature of the whole universe, then, um, and the nature of God itself, according to uh, Spinoza and uh, other thinkers that I've already mentioned, then it, we are virtuous if we strive to maintain our existence. I should note, I should tell you that he's not just talking about the existence of the body, he's talking about the existence of your mind. Because many people's minds are no longer their own minds. Their minds are programmed by parents, society, peers, um, teachers, any number of people, religious people, spiritual people. And what their mind is in its pure state, they've lost. So they haven't maintained the existence of their mind. It's been kind of hijacked by a whole pile of other influences. So power is a useful way of looking at um, the canatus. It's the expression of a power, the power to exist as we want to exist. So let's talk about um, love and hate. Uh, Spinoza's take on love is not at all romantic. Love is what you feel or what we feel when something external enhances our power in some way. If you get a million dollars dropped into your bank account, you're going to love that million dollars. Uh, or if you have been lusting after a a Ferrari and you buy your Ferrari you're going to love that thing because it enhances your power. So we just love the things that enhance our power in some way. Um, equally we love our children usually anyway because they carry our genes and they enhance our power. I mean not always but that's the idea that we effectively amplify our power through our kids. Hate is just the opposite, of course. Um, it results from something that diminishes our power. So getting fired, you'll probably hate the boss you had if you get fired. Becoming ill, getting divorced, you know, people who get divorced end up hating each other usually. Uh, violence directed towards yourself, well, you'll hate the person who does that. Any that anything that diminishes your power, you will hate. So, uh, what Spinoza then goes on to say, notice this is kind of like a cascading waterfall. It starts with the canatus, it goes through ideas such as um, power, uh, the striving to exist, the emotions of love and hate, and then from love and hate come a whole raft of emotions. So, love might bring about excitement, some kind of enjoyment, um, 
enthusiasms and so on, whereas hate brings about things like anger, envy, and derision. Spinoza's pretty big on envy. Uh, he says, in fact, he goes as far as to say that envy is really the default state of many people. And his famous statement that we pity those less fortunate than ourselves and we envy those more fortunate. Yeah, there's a whole riff on uh, envy, but I'll move on. Uh, I mentioned shame earlier. Shame is an emotion that derives from a diminished sense of power. We feel shame because we believe that something we have done will diminish us in the eyes of the herd. So let's say you've stolen money and you, you, you don't want other people to know about it. Maybe you don't want your family to know about it. You'd feel shame because you're then rejected by the herd. Uh, other emotions include things like open fear, remorse, regret, guilt. Uh, Spinoza, as far as Spinoza is concerned, these are just natural phenomena, and they can be dealt with through the use of reason. So let me get to really the the important part in the sense of, you know, we've talked about this cascading thing, the desire to exist and how it then fans out into a whole pile of uh, emotions. As far as Spinoza is concerned, the claim or Spinoza claims that we can moderate our emotions through understanding them. Now that's a big claim, but actually it's very similar to Gurdjieff's um, claim that our real everyday consciousness, or, sorry, our everyday consciousness is not really our real consciousness. The subconscious is our real consciousness. What we do through understanding our emotions through understanding our nature is effectively educate our subconscious. We don't, you know, do it consciously. We just come to understand things. And as we do, then our subconscious changes. If we want change, it comes from the subconscious. We don't have to do anything. Understanding why you get angry doesn't mean that you try to stop being angry. When you understand it, you will find that anger diminishes eventually because your subconscious has effectively um, reconciled some issues that it had. So, um, understanding, for example, that you may be feeling down simply because life circumstances are diminishing you can offer some relief. Look, um, my wife mentors, uh, I can't remember how many people it is, probably about a dozen people. Uh, and we've had um, recently a, a get-together, about a dozen people there as well. All of whom have seen this happen in their own life. You know, people who were very angry, who were uh, depressed maybe, who were fearful. These things start to melt away as you start to practice this, there are some additional things you need to do because, as Spinoza says, and I'll get onto this shortly as well, the emotions are actually in the body. So if you're not aware of your body, you're not aware of your emotions. So um, there's endless examples I could give. You know, if you if there's if there's a job promotion going and somebody else gets it, you'll feel envious. Why? Because they've increased their power and maybe you saw that that promotion would increase your power and so you, you get envious. By understanding these things, oh yeah, I'm feeling envious because da, 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 the emotions do diminish. They don't disappear, but they do diminish and so it brings some relief from some pain that you might feel with some negative emotion. Um, now, to get on to this uh, whole thing of the emotions being in our body. It's certainly the case that for many people, uh, they kind of live in their heads. They, they think that the, their emotions are in their heads. So if you see someone run a key down the side of your car, then the thoughts will start going. Oh, you know, that guy's just run the key down the side of my car. 
uh, I'm re really angry. And the thoughts, you will think that the thoughts in your head are the emotion. They're not. The emotion is in your body. As Spinoza says, and this is right at the start of part three of the ethics, where he deals with emotions. By emotion, I understand the affections of the body by which the body's power of activity is increased or diminished, assisted or checked, together with the ideas of these affections. So you get the idea, you know, this guy's done this and I really hate him and whatever, but the actual experience of the emotion is the body, which is why you have to be, have you have to have good contact with your body to deal with the emotions. It's not just, it's not enough just to think about stuff. So, um, to summarize all of this, <clears throat> yeah, it was a bit long, wasn't it? Uh, to summarize all of this, the root of all our behaviors lies in our survival drive. When we're surviving well, we're happy. When we're not, we're unhappy. It's that simple. Understanding our emotions, and Spinoza in part five of the ethics even gives a few exercises that you can do to help you along the way with this. Um, the understanding of the emotions helps us diminish them. And since many of the emotions are painful emotions, so we can rid ourselves of you know, a fair amount of pain. The emotions never disappear. While you've got a body, you're going to have emotions. Um, you know, just very briefly, we inherit the emotions from the animals. You know, the reptiles have a reptilian brain. The animals have a limbic system, which is <clears throat> the emotional brain. A rat, for example, uh, the nerves from the nose of a rat go straight into its limbic system, into its emotional brain. If it smells a piece of cheese, it's happy. If it smells a cat, it, it runs away. There's no thought there at all. It's just pure emotion. And that's what our emotions are. They're kind of shortcuts of behavior. But they can be painful. So, the whole thing is very simple. We strive to survive. As soon as you know that, you have, or you can unwind, pretty much the whole understanding of our emotional nature. And that is essentially uh, Spinoza's psychology. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> so this is a bit added on the end. Um, I wrote a document called Spinozian Psychology, which you can download for free. So there's a link below to my Patreon site that um, uh, has a, you know, a, a posting. Uh, it's free to go to. There's no uh, fee or anything. You can go there and you can download the document uh, for free. So if you're interested in the document, then you know, go there. <laughs>